We're going to take a look at the shepherd, the true shepherd tonight. Um, but before we do that, I want to welcome you. I want to welcome all of you that are watching online. And we just pray that this is going to be uh, another fantastic study and that through it, we'll get to know Jesus a little bit better. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we thank you again for another chapter in the book of John, another night to see Jesus through the eyes of John the disciple, the one who called himself the disciple that Jesus loved. What a different perspective. And Lord, we pray that through this, we will see ourselves as the one that you love. Because that is the point. You love us. You sent your son to die for us. And everything that is written in this book is to help us to see and understand that. So Lord, tonight we pray that you would lead us a little closer to you, that you would open our eyes, help us to see you a little more clearly, and above all things, that we'll feel your presence and know that you are our God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, John chapter 10, and as I said, this is a, this is a good chapter, um, an excellent one. Actually, we're not going to get all the way through this whole thing. I guarantee you uh, we're not going to get through it all tonight, but we're going to get as far as we can. Um, we're going to start with the first six verses, and then let's just kind of see where we are from there. John chapter 10, verse 1. I'm reading now New King James Version. If you're reading along, whether you're on your phone or your paper Bible, it doesn't matter. And whatever version you use is okay. Uh, but if you notice a few different words than what you have in your Bible, I'm reading out of this version. Uh, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the, sheep, the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his, own vo or he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers." Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. And I'm going to, I'm going to start in verse 6 because John puts that it's going to be explained as we go through. Jesus actually explains this out. But I think before, what you're going to hear as we go through this discussion, we'll probably be referring to things that we've not read yet because it helps explain these first six verses. So... I think the first thing I want you guys to recognize is there's a lot of symbolisms in this. Mm -hmm. um, we could be talking about a flock of sheep that was literal. Um, Jesus may have actually used a literal flock of sheep that was not far by. Um, maybe one that they passed recently, or maybe it was within view. But whatever, he was using that to illustrate. And, and so I want to pull out some of these symbolisms and just kind of get a foundation for what Jesus is actually talking about here. Um, and, and I'm going to open this up to my team. We've got Dina, Jack, and Dennis with me tonight, um, my regular crew. And I just want you to know it's not limited to them, though. It's limited to anybody who has a response. Uh, you're welcome to open up and respond to this. So the first one that I see is sheepfold. He who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same as the same a thief and a robber. What is the sheepfold that he's referring to? Which verse are you in? Is it? That's verse one. Sheep. Okay, mine says sheep pen. All right. Sheep pen. Mm -hmm. Sheep pen, sheepfold. Um, you know, interestingly... I was on my way over the Mogollon Rim once, and I was actually getting ready to do a study on this, and I looked out, if you've ever been up on the, on the top of the rim, you, you know, you got some fields for a while, but then you get into the woods, and the last thing I ever expected to see was a sheep pen, and guess what I saw? I saw a sheep pen right out in the middle of the woods <laughs> in the trees, and there were sheep in there, and I was like, what a perfect illustration, um, <laughs> but you don't expect that out in the middle of the woods, you know? Yeah. Expected out in the field. I think that he's talking about a 
literal sheet pen or fold. And in, in that time, they would often have more than one flock staying in a pen. Okay. And that adds a little bit of light to the fact that Jesus says he knows his sheep, he calls his out by name, and they're the ones that follow me. So a part of the role of the shepherd was to distinguish and call out his sheep. Hmm. So there's a little bit of judgment involved in the shepherd's role, and that kind of ties in to the end of the last study we had when Jesus was talking about, I, haven't come, I have come to judge. Mm -hmm. I haven't come mm -hmm. to condemn, but he did come to judge. Uh, to the blind man. You could use the word decide. Decide, yeah. Separate. So, the same thing. The, the blind man could see, but that seeing was not only literal, it was also a spiritual seeing of Christ. And the other guys who could see were blind. Mm -hmm. And so that blind spiritually. So that was the distinguishing mark that Jesus used to separate those who were his followers. And then we see him carrying it on in a really powerful illustration of the shepherd. Mm -hmm. I think what's interesting there is he knows all his sheep by name. You know, when, when we look at that, the, the shepherd knows all his sheep by name. They're, he's familiar with them. He has a relationship with them. Um, and, and I've never shepherded, but, you know, most, most of the stories I've read about shepherds and that, they spend a lot of time out there in the field with the sheep. It, it's not something that they just send the sheep out and, and let them go and then call them back in. They're actually out there with them. Dennis. I was interested to read that in the times of Palestine, a lot of times there wasn't even a sheep fold or a pen or anything. Actually, it was usually a cave mm -hmm. or it was any kind of an enclosure. It could even be stones or rocks or whatever. That was very interesting. And a lot of times, it was only wide, this, this gate, so to speak, um, was only wide enough for just one sheep to go through. Hmm. And meaning that a lot of times, and this also has some spiritual implications, this gate or this door, or uh, the Greek word is thyra here, which really can only just mean an entrance. Meaning that... A lot of times it was just guarded by no more than the shepherd who slept right there in the opening, the opening. Now that's very interesting because a lot of times it's just Jesus hmm. who is our gate, who is, you know, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So I just was intrigued by that, yeah. you know, and, yeah. and Dino. So. <laughs> I, I've been chomping at the bit here, but so you far are. nobody said what I wanted to say. So, that's how it works. Okay, I think I think we need to make sure that we are nailing down the the connection between what we're reading here and the previous part, because the Pharisees threw out of the synagogue the blind man who had been healed, mm -hmm. and disowned him, said, you're not a sheep. Um, you can't be a part of this fold anymore. Yeah. And threw him in, out of their enclosure. So yes, threw him out of their enclosure. And, and he, then Jesus starts this, and there is a definite connection between the two in John's mind uh, because he starts chapter 10, which in the Greek didn't have a chapter there. Mm. <laughs> and the next, the next sentence begins with, amen, amen. <laughs> Greek, truly, truly, very truly, I say to you. It gets translated all these different ways, but the, in Greek it's amen, amen. Um, and, he, and he's just saying, all of these things have happened and truly be connected to that. Truly, I say to you that, any, that anyone who does not enter by the sheep pen by the gate, and he goes on through this, this illustration, this story. And so there is a... Uh, connection between the whole passage 
and the fact that the blind man had been cast out of the synagogue. So he's still talking to those Jews, those Pharisees yeah. that, that we're talking about when yeah. he said, you remain in your sin, you know, you're and, and a little, not too long Spiritual before blind. that, you're going to die in your sins, uh, but you remain in your sins, you're blind. He's still talking to those same people. He has none of, none of the, the attention has been changed. Right. John. Verse 3, the porter, the gatekeeper. Or the gatekeeper, which would be the gatekeeper, the doorkeeper. Yeah, but it's that's Jesus. We'll get to that. <laughs> You're close. Yeah, that's <laughs> You're real close. But we've established the literal, and Dean has bridged the gap here from the literal to the spiritual. Um, because when, when we're talking about sheepfolds in the Bible, we're talking about churches. We're talking about a, a group, an enclosure. A, you know, Jesus talks about his sheep. I have sheep in other folds. You know, um, we look at the sheep that Jesus has. And the Jews at those times believed that their church, their synagogue, their temple, whatever, what, their religious structure yeah. was the church. And if you were outside that church, you were left out to the wolves. There was nothing safe. And, not, not just their local synagogue, but the but the Jewish belief as a whole. Yes. And, and I think... Judaism. That, yes, and this is also spiritually applying to the belief as a whole. Yeah. Um, I think also we're finding out here um, as we go, but they talk about people climbing in through other ways and going through this door. And what's interesting is, is these Pharisees claimed to be the shepherds That's right. of the flock. That's right. So they had their own uh, enclosures. Uh, they had their own people. They guarded their own. They were considered the guards of those sheepfolds mm -hmm. that they mm -hmm. had. But Jesus is trying to make a separation here, Absolutely. saying that I, I am the shepherd. And there are thieves and robbers who would like to have you think that they're the shepherds. But the fact is that Jesus is the way. So, so to get a picture of what Jesus is talking about, what is, in biblical times, what is a thief and what is a robber? Why does he use both? Because both of them are stealing, right? Why would he have to say thieves and robbers? Thieves are the ones that just happen to, to take something. A robber is going to break into the home and, and take something. Well, I think, but too, the robber is more violent. Yes. They're more violent. Yeah. There's more what's angst, maybe. <laughs> Not the word I'm looking for, but it gives you the picture yeah. of they're, they're more deliberate. They're going to take it no matter what happens to you. Right. They don't care about you. I think John had a, a thief steals a secret. Okay, so a thief steals in secret. He's the guy dressed in black and waits till everybody's out of the house and then he goes in and steals versus a robber. He goes in violently, whether you're in or not. Uh, armed robbery, we might say. You know, think of robbing a bank. Um, that's the difference in the two pictures. So, so when Jesus is referring here to thieves and robbers and, and he's talking to the Pharisees, the ones who call themselves the shepherds, and he's like, you guys come in through another way, you know, you, you cr climbed over the wall. You didn't come through the door to get here. Um, and so he's pointing a finger at them saying, you're thieves and robbers, but what were the Pharisees stealing and, and violently being robbers no. of? Well, number one, they were trying to put Jesus to death. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, this, this, and we know that from previous chapters we've already read that they were already plotting to kill him. Hmm. So okay. That, that's uh, fairly violent. That's fairly violent. Fairly and violent. They, how many times they picked up stones to... Um, yeah. Or push him over. So that's or, the brutality, the right. forcefulness yeah. of the robbers. Which was also in, in the chapter before. Walt. They were thieves in that it was their rule, you know, I can dedicate my money to the temple and I don't have to take care of my parents. They okay. stole their funds from taking care of their parents. 
Okay, so stole it from their parents. So they've got a history of dishonesty in business. Um, maybe it was, went a little bit further. Maybe that's how they became so wealthy. You know, is maybe they were being dishonest. Whatever it was, you know, the idea is they would stop at nothing to to accumulate their wealth and protect it. I'm yeah. thinking. I'm thinking. <laughs> I'm thinking too of the. Again, the blind man who got cast out of the synagogue, okay. they were taking upon themselves a decision to cast this man out, and they weren't the gatekeeper. Yeah. They weren't the shepherd. They thought they were. They thought they were, but yeah. they, were, they, shouldn't, they were taking a role they shouldn't have, and I think that it, it's hard for us to wrap our brain around because it's kind of the opposite. They cast him out, and you think of a thief as taking, but I think it's the same idea. Think of it like this. Remember, we talked about their, in their viewpoint, if you were not part of the church, you had no salvation. They were essentially stealing his salvation. Okay. Okay. Um, they're stealing his salvation, and they're violently shoving him out of the church so he cannot have it. Yeah. Um, That's what I think the bottom line of this whole thing, thieves and robbers, is that they're offering a means of salvation uh, other than salvation salvation by faith in christ that's mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. that's the i think the kind of bottom line well there. yeah salvation here let's get into our door here that uh, john brought up because there's only one door and, and like dennis said a lot of times it was narrow only one sheep is going to go through at a time because it was a narrow entrance way and, and so this door john mentioned he asked what does that symbol does it does it represent the father um Jesus. It, well, he didn't say door. I think gate. he was talking about the, gate. the porter. Oh, the is what he said. Oh, the, yeah, the porter, the doorkeeper. So we're talking okay. about the gatekeeper. Okay, yeah. so who's the gatekeeper? My bad, my bad. So who is the gatekeeper? Um, is it the father? I'd like to suggest that the gatekeeper is not somebody over the shepherd. The shepherd is the main one. So the gatekeeper, and literally in Greek, and that's hard to tell in King James Version what that even means, but the gatekeeper was actually the assistant to the shepherd. They were the understudies. They were the, like the disciples of Jesus, disciples. So they were, they were the people who would be the assistants. That's the, the gatekeeper, I think. Um, Walt, John no, Denna, Walt, I think John, John did you have your hand up? Oh, too? okay. Yeah. Yeah, Malachi 3.8, they talk about robbery being of the tithes and offerings from God. Um, so, and, and we see in the temple they were using robbery, they were stealing money from, from what should have been offered to God. John. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Everybody, part of that promise is part of the sheepfold. Let's, let's repeat that, because that was good. Yeah. Uh, that, that the verse that says, and Jack, you can quote it much better than me, but those who are... Say it again, John. If anyone is Jesus, be, be of Jesus Christ, they are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Mm -hmm. yeah. That is the description of who are the sheep. Okay, okay. In Christ. Good, yeah. excellent. Walt? A few verses on down, Jesus says very clearly about the door. He is the door yeah. Yeah. to the sheepfold. And since we're talking about verses, um, you know, we're talking about what's the difference of a robber and a thief. I like, I agree with you, Walt. I like to have the Bible interpret itself. And it literally says right here in verse 10, the thief comes not only to take or to steal, but to kill and destroy. So that's fairly violent, and that's the thief too. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah. and with that description you gave, 
of a common sheepfold where uh, it was a very narrow door. If the shepherd was literally standing or laying in it, yeah. he was the door as this yes, that, that verse Jesus. coming up describes exactly. That's, so you're, you're yeah. exactly right on that. that yeah. That's what I was, I was hoping to get to because the cave doesn't necessarily have a door on it. You know, if they're keeping the sheep in a cave, they didn't build a door and attach it necessarily. Now, they might have, um, but I would say most times not. And, and the shepherd or whomever was there, they were the door. They acted as a door. They laid down and slept there all night, so nothing could get to the sheep unless they went through him. Um, and so I think it's a reference. I think it's a reference to Jesus Christ because he's the one that says he laid down his life um, for, for salvation for his friends. Uh, so I think we're referring to Jesus as being the, the door, the doorkeeper. Um, I, I think it's all going to point to Jesus. Within this but passage. Within this passage, it says, yes. It says those different things. Yeah, and it, this passage is a, a continuation of everything that we've looked at from John 1 all the way through the beginning. Uh, when Jesus said he was the Son of Man, and then he said he is the living water. And in chapter 6, the bread of life. And then the water of life. And then the light of the world in chapter 8. Mm. And then last chapter, he, he associated with the creator because he healed, didn't heal. He opened the eyes of a man who didn't have whatever it took to see because he was born blind. And, and so that's a bit of creation, becoming a creator. And that's why they got so upset with him. Now he's coming in with the whole shebang, even after he declared, before Abraham was, I am, I think he's making an even louder declaration here when he says that he is the, he, he is the shepherd, he is the, sh the gate, you can't get in except through Christ, and he is also the lamb, mm -hmm. the sheep. And you say, well, how can that be? It's because he's God, and that's what the whole sequence of the first nine chapters of John is all about, is that Jesus is God, and he can only be, only God can do the things that Jesus is doing and that he's about to do. And like you said, we'll, we'll talk about it later, but lay down his life. Well, anybody can lay down their life, but not lay it down and take it back, pick it up. back up again himself. And that's when he really is just screaming out, you know, I, I am God, follow me, and I can give you life. So I see a progression. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, in the next chapter is the resurrection of Lazarus. And mm -hmm. So you said something that made me think. Because Jesus is making a very loud declaration of who he is. I, I, I think he's making a very loud and clear, he, he's continuing that, that, that declaration, sorry, I don't have a better word, that declaration uh, of who he is. But that declaration of those thieves and robbers is pretty loud and clear too, yeah. isn't it? Ten times. He refers to the thieves, robbers, strangers, ten times in ten these times. first few verses. So there's an emphasis <laughs> here. And I think yeah. Jesus is drawing a distinction. Again, you know, we, we've noticed before in the book of John, he's drawing a distinction between himself the father and, and the way that that they go about salvation the way that they go about ruling humanity and there's always someone that he's drawing a distinction against in that process talk about thieves and robbers here mm. who was the first thief and robber that humanity encountered Jesus. Sorry? Satan. Lucifer, Lucifer or, or Satan. serpent the serpent yeah. back in the Garden of Eden. What happened in the Garden of Eden? Even before in heaven. Even before in heaven, but as far as humanity's history goes, mm -hmm. for what we have the written record of happening directly with us, um, Eve, Eve and Adam are walking in the garden, they're working in the garden, and uh, Eve comes up to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There's the serpent. The serpent speaks to her and gets her in a conversation and and convinces her that it's it is okay to eat this fruit you know i know god said that but you're not really gonna die 
you know, and, and in fact, not only are you not going to die, but you're going to be like God. You're going to be, you're going to have powers that you never imagined. You know, think of it, you know, and, and really he left it open-ended. You fill in the blank of whatever you think it is that you should have. That's what this is going to deliver to you. He didn't even deliver it. He, he didn't even say what it was going to be. He just left it open. And, and so Eve was convinced and she took of that fruit. At that point, what had happened, he had stolen from humanity eternal life. He left them to die in the Garden of Eden. As far as he was concerned, he did his job. God's children were there. God has no choice but to kill them now because he said. And, and of course, we know that God comes along with a, a different plan. But Satan's motive, Lucifer's motive, the serpent, the motive there... Mm -hmm was violently stealing away from God his children and causing the death of children. And so I think there's a little bit more here than just attacking the Pharisees and the scribes. I think there's a distinct declaration, there is a power of God and there is a power that is against God. And you're on one side or the other. You notice there's no third option. You're either following the, the, the shepherd or you're not. You're either coming in through the gate, you either enter into the kingdom through Jesus Christ or you don't. And so I think, you know, while we look at this, is, is, and, and there is the declaration of the scribes, Pharisees, and religious leaders, I think it was more of a, guys, you're standing on the wrong side. You're, you're making the wrong choices. You're acting as the thieves and the robbers here. You, you've taken the side of the thief and the robber because there's only Jesus and only Satan that, that are the two authorities here. And, and Jesus, we know, is the authority over all. I think another thing that I found right there in the uh, third verse is that there's a, a good amount of righteousness by faith in here too. Mm -hmm. And that's, um, that's this relationship mm -hmm. with Jesus. Because it says right here, he calls his own sheep by name. Mm. That's all true. But they wouldn't even know to recognize him if they didn't know his voice. Mm. And they know his voice because of a relationship that they have with Jesus. You know, it's interesting... They did an experiment. I don't know if anybody saw this. They did an experiment. And they had mothers and their children. And the children were like toddler age. They weren't very old. A little bit varying age. But anyway, they had them. And what they did is um, they blindfolded the children. And they brought them out in front of the mothers. And the children could go. They could talk to the mother. They could touch the mother. They could smell the mother. And all these different things. And every last child knew who their mother was. There was never any question that, no, no, mommy, you know, it, it was all the way through. They knew their mother. They knew their parent. And it's the same with God's children. Because they have that relationship they've spent time with, they know, you know, when, when Jesus calls, they recognize when a stranger calls, that's not Jesus. That's not my master. That's not my mommy, so to speak. Mm -hmm. I don't know who you are, but you're not my mommy, and I'm not going with you. And they'll run, <laughs> yeah. like I said here. Yeah, so, so I think that's the picture of what you're talking mm -hmm. about there is that righteousness by faith it is based on that close relationship that is developed over time. Sharon. Yes. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah, he calls us by name. Mm -hmm. But he knows. Yeah. God knows us by our name, is what she was saying. Well, and, and that's the beautiful thing. You know, you mentioned the little grain of sand on a beach. Out of all the billions of people who have lived in existence, he knows how many hairs are on my head now that I quit shaving. <laughs> Even before. Which it's still not as many as, as maybe Dennis or Jack, but, uh, but he knows exactly how many's up there. I just had an awesome thought 
that I know is going to bring tears to my voice, but um, God knows the names of those babies and moms that were in that hospital that were bombed today. Yeah. Yeah. He, he knows their names. He knows those who were not yet born, yeah. whose, whose mothers lost their lives. Yeah. Yeah, and isn't that awesome to think about? That a God who's who's got all these things. We were talking about the creation of the stars, and and was it all at once, or was it here and then expanded out? You know, out of all that creation, out of all the things that God has control over, all the things that He maintains, He knows each one of us Amen. before we were ever born. You know, the Bible says before you were formed in the womb. You know, so think about that. Mm-hmm. that's that relationship that's mm-hmm. that's the shepherd that we're talking about he knows you i mean better than you know yourself and that's the one who's calling you out by name and asking you to follow and the key there i think you know you mentioned it mentioned calls him by name but his sheep know his voice mm-hmm. it's a two-way so street how do they know his voice well because of their relationship, they have learned to recognize his voice. Yeah, it's is a, it the sound, the audible sound of his voice? Or this is a voice. What is it right talking here. about? It says they this know is God's voice. word. Right here. Yeah, That's God's word. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and it's spending time with it. Yeah. Um, I remember... If you know my testimony, I was out of the church for 25 years. And, and in that time, I still counted myself as knowing the Bible, knowing God and, and all. And it was interesting because somebody brought up something in the Bible. And I'm sitting there thinking, well, there is no book in the Bible by that name. And I said it. And the guy looked at me and he said, yes, there is. Now, he, he was a, a part-time preacher. We worked together in sales, but on the weekends, he was a preacher. And I was calling him out. I was like, it's, it's not there. I went home and Googled it. I was humbled. <laughs> My point is, it's one thing to be in your Bible, to study it, to memorize it, to know it, to have all this stuff. But you have to continue in it. Because mm-hmm. if you stop... And that dust starts building up on this Bible and you aren't opening it up. You don't remember things as clearly as what you think you remember them. And and even not just books of the Bible, but verses, you know, they don't say what you thought they said. And, And, you know, some of the things that you justified yourself, well, it's in the Bible and it's okay may not read the way you thought it read and maybe it's not okay. Mm -hmm. So my, what I'm saying is we got to be in here regularly. Sorry, I got John and then. I mean, yeah. yeah. John Dennis. <laughs> it's kind of a thing that's pretty obvious to people who have an open heart. I can take a microphone. And one of the things is everything yeah. in the natural world is kind of God's name. If you start looking at creation, the creation. world speaks of God's voice. It speaks to us. If you're open to it, and if you're praying to God, you start to hear his voice in different ways, answered prayers that are very subtle usually. In my, it's been my experience that God answers prayers subtly often, yes. but, but the natural world sings his voice. Yeah, we were, in, uh, we were in class today, and, and one of the questions is, we're talking about communication, it's marriage and family, and we're talking about communication between family, but we also talk about communication with God, uh, because we believe God is the head of our family. And, and so the question was, have you ever reached out to God, communicated with God, and got a response? And what does that look like? 
you know, and, and we just we just prayed earlier in our prayer meeting. You know, we we were praying for somebody who was in the hospital, didn't know what was wrong or anything. Wound up, it was a kidney stone. It passed. He's already back to work. You know, there's an answered prayer. There's God's voice. Um, you know, there's other instances. Creation. You mentioned creation. If you look at creation close enough, you start seeing God and, and understanding who He is through creation. Um, and, and so there are, there's so many ways you can hear God's voice sometimes through something that somebody says, you know, I remember, and I'm, I hope I'm not telling on myself, this is before I was a pastor it was the first sermon I preached in America. Uh, but I remember I, I, I did this sermon and I got down and I was like, who finally got through the first one, you know, um, relieved. And this lady comes up and she said, can I speak to you for a minute? And I said, sure you know and i'm like i hope she knows i'm not a pastor yet you know <laughs> i'm just up here you know sharing testimony time anyway she took me aside and she was asking me to pray for her son for this and that and then she said and when you said this and she went off on this this thing and i'm sitting there thinking man i never said that that was never in there but i'm taking notes because that's good stuff you know i think god sometimes speaks through people Amen. as well you know, that's when, when we have these studies, you know, God will speak through you to somebody, you know, answering a question that, and they're listening out there on, on the internet. God will answer a question through you. They'll answer their question. You know, they'll hear the answer that they were searching for for so long. So, you know, but it all comes down to, it, it needs to agree with this. You know, uh, when, it, when, when we hear those things, we always need to be able to go back here and, and reference it, and, and that's a that's a twofold witness. That and then we can be sure that it is the voice of God. The other John. Uh, if Abraham didn't know the Father's voice, he and Isaac would not sneaked out from the tent and not tell the mother. Oh. So Abraham, when when God told him to go take Isaac up on mm -hmm. the mountain, and yeah, you, you would say, well. If he told me to murder my son, then maybe it's the devil talking to me. But yeah. he knew his father's voice. Yeah. Yeah. He, he knew, he understood that would have been tricky, but he knew God's voice and followed it. And that too, if he didn't recognize God's voice, he would have killed Isaac. Because yeah. God was also the one that stopped and said, don't do it. Well, to bring it down to earth a bit, God, God came to him in a vision and God told him to sacrifice his son. But it was very interesting that Abraham started to question whether that was really God. Okay. I mean, it was interesting that he said, wait a minute, I'd like a sign. I'd like to make sure that this is, and he got nothing. Why? Because God already knew that he knew his voice. Mm. So it was very interesting that God literally, literally uh, knew. And the same thing happened when Abraham was told to go. Not knowing where he was going, mm -hmm. not with Isaac, but all the way back, well, with Isaac too, but all the way back to the beginning of Hebrew. And yeah, and he already had a relationship all the way back when he was in Ur. I mean, that's interesting. Abraham already had a relationship with God by then. Mm -hmm. And when God told him to go, he went. He, he already knew that God knew. He knew that God's will for his life was what he needed to do. So, <laughs> That's true, he didn't. <laughs> so what does that mean for us today? I mean, all the things that we're talking about, you know, sheepfolds and, and, and churches and um, Jesus and, and an evil Satan working against him and, and knowing his voice. What does that got to do with us? Just shall live by faith. And the unjust won't get into that sheepfold. 
because they don't even know the door. They don't know the gate. And what's interesting is Jesus said, Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was even talking about. And why was that? Because they chose not to. Hmm. Well, they, they understood what a shepherd was. Yes. And they knew that, well, I mean, Psalm 20, the 23rd Psalm, how does that start? The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord, is my shepherd. The Lord Yahweh, Jehovah, is my shepherd. They, yeah. they knew that. Yeah. And they knew that they were supposed to be shepherds of the flock. And they also knew, according to uh, Isaiah, uh, Ezekiel 34, that there were false shepherds and God condemned the false shepherds. So they knew all that stuff. But they didn't understand was, that, like you said, Jesus is the good shepherd. Yeah. He is, the Lord is, is our shepherd. They didn't accept the fact that it was Jesus. And so and how they couldn't oft, understand it. How often have we already studied this, have in all these chapters, where Jesus will say something, and all they did is took the literal didn't they work. took it literal, not spiritual. Same mm -hmm. thing. Notice Jesus. Notice it says here. But the, um, Jesus used this figure of speech. In other words, they understood the, the, what do you, the, the, the real, the literal. The literal. Yeah. All right. They understood that. Yeah. They understood it. They understood it from Psalms 23, like you said. They understood it. But they chose not to make the transition between what he was talking about and the spiritual Messiah right. who was right there with them right That's then. That's right. I'm wondering, well I'm wondering how much of not understanding had more to do... They, they, their minds may have said, okay, yeah, I get, I get what he's talking about. I know, I know all about the, the Lord is my shepherd and all that. But they couldn't accept the fact that they may be the thief and robber. And so they didn't get that piece of it. They, they didn't apply it in their own hearts. And to your question, maybe that's what we need to be doing now. Not that we're the thief and robber, but let's apply this to our own hearts and lives. Okay. Make sure we're applying it to ourselves. Okay. Um, so they were shepherds, but not the good shepherd. The false See, I agree with that. Yeah. They fully, I don't think they at all thought that they were th thieves and robbers. That was totally out there. Yeah. They totally assumed they were shepherds. Yeah. But they were in the way of the real shepherd. And that was the problem. You, you asked the question, what, so what does that mean to us? And I think that Paul kind of lays it out there for us in, in Ephesians 4.11 it was he who gave some to be apostles some to be prophets some to be evangelists and some to be pastors and teachers and the past the word pastor there is related to shepherd mm -hmm. and so that same principle applies to us today and these are gifts that we get through the Holy Spirit so we need to be careful and faithful that we're leading people through the real gate and mm. not throwing out uh, stumbling blocks out there to lead people through the wrong gate. And not just our pastor of the church. I mean, he's, he is a good pastor, but we all have gifts that God gave us to use, and we have to be just as responsible as he is. Mm. So Absolutely. anybody can be a stumbling yeah. block. Okay. How, how is that? Because nobody looks at anybody else except for the pastor, right? <laughs> well, and, and again, I'd like to suggest that we saw this, is in verse 3, the gatekeeper opens the gate for him. Who is him? The shepherd. In other words, the gatekeeper is, are those disciples or us? 
that are working closely with the shepherd yeah. in pointing the way to the shepherd and the door and the door. I've got um, Walt or John, yeah, and I don't know who do. was first. But yeah, I think Walt was. I think Walt was first, yeah. okay. So if you think that God is talking to you, how do you know it's him? That's what we were saying before. It always has to go back to this. It's got to be agreeable with what's in here. To the law and if the you prophets. know that, you'll know the voice of God. Yeah, Amen. to the law and the prophets, um, which that's a good verse. Um, how do we know what we read? I, I'm not going to go down that. <laughs> we don't have enough time to get into that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <clears throat> the leaders felt that this Jesus was abridging their authority. So therefore, they, they says Barabbas, not Jesus. Yeah. Okay, I am going to go into it. <laughs> because here, here's why. Because the leaders of those days were the ones who were instructing the people about the Word of God. They were the ones who was opening up the Word of God to the people. So how do we know when we read this Bible that we're understanding it the way that God wants it to be understood? Okay, through the Holy Spirit, but how do we know, how do we know the Holy Spirit is the one leading us? My knee-jerk, knee-jerk standard answer compares Scripture with Scripture, especially if, it's some, if, if you're reading something that's hard to understand or you come up with some idea that's kind of mm. new and different. Make sure that you compare what you're hearing with the rest of Scripture. Okay, so it's real easy to, I say it's real easy, let me watch how I say that. It can be real easy to go in and read a verse and say, oh, well, see, this says. Oh, yeah. yeah. On the other hand, go back and make sure that the rest of the Bible is saying the same thing, too. Yeah. Because there are some verses that we might not understand clearly but if you go through the Bible and find everything to get the context, you know, read the context of that verse, that chapter, the book, and then also refer to other places where it's talking about the same thing, you know, where Peter says this about it, and Paul says that, and John says this, and the Old Testament says this, and get that, get that big, big picture. Big picture. And, and because sometimes people do, they'll find something in there and they'll say, ah, oh, see, right there it says, you know, and... That's good enough for me. I can shut the. I don't need to read the rest of the Bible because I read that one verse. Here a little, there a little. What's that? Here a little, there a little. Here a little, there a little. So, uh, discernment is something that Sharon said. Discernment. Discernment is something given by the Holy Spirit, but there's on our end our diligence. Yeah. Uh, Paul commented on the Bereans. The Bereans heard the word and then they went and studied it. You know, is that what it says? And then they look through and find, and okay, yep, what you're speaking is truth. You know, they didn't just take his word for it, but they went and double-checked. John? That kind of... So last week we were talking about who sinned, his parents or him. Mm -hmm. And the answer was neither one of them. But then in the Bible it also says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So what was actually being said there when he said neither his parents or him? I believe what was really being said there was his blindness has nothing to do with sin. Right. Yes. Yeah. And that's the way it was said, but... Yes, exactly right. His blindness was not caused by sin. Yeah. Mm. Um, were they sinners? Yes. But it wasn't called, it, that wasn't what caused his blindness. Right. It, exactly. You know, that's going in and reading what is it really saying, you know, um, and, and that's where you got to go and get the full context and understand. Now, we just made it sound like it's really hard to know Jesus and his word and hear his voice, but I think that's where Sharon's comment about the Holy Spirit comes into play, because when the Holy Spirit is leading you, it opens it up and it clarifies it for you, and, and that's where you start seeing it, but again, you know, Dennis was just saying, it's that relationship, that time spent together. If we're not spending the time with God and, and getting a clear sound of his voice, we won't recognize it. We'll hear something out of the Bible. We'll hear that one verse. We'll hear that preacher say this or that. 
And, and it'll sound like it makes all kinds of sense because that's what we want to hear. That's what we want to believe. But we have to go in there and, and look at it. We have to see it for ourselves. That's our relationship with God. I can't, I can't, I can't know God's voice because Dennis has been studying with Jesus. Because Dennis has been spending all this quality time with Jesus. That doesn't mean that when they, they call out that I'll recognize it too. I have to have that connection and, and be with Jesus Christ and spending that time. And this is where we as members in the church have to be very careful. We're not relying on the pastor's experience. Thank you. <laughs> because it's so easy to sit back and say, oh, the, we got a good pastor. And man, he's so close to the Lord. And I can listen to what he's saying and I can just hear God's voice. But that doesn't take the place of knowing God's voice for ourselves. And it never should. Now, I want to clarify, because I don't want everybody to just quit coming to church and listen, you know, not <laughs> listen to sermons either. <laughs> the point is, you know, there, there was an a, a, a old law, ancient law in Israel, and it is by the word of two or three witnesses. You hear it in church, now let me go home and read it and study it for myself. Um, maybe let me refer back to somebody else and... And let's get a clear picture that way. That's the point of it, is, is don't just take somebody's word for it, but study it for yourself. Amen. And, and I think when we, when we combine all that together, that's the key to knowing his voice. You know, that's the key to knowing when he speaks and hearing and, and following him is because we've covered all these bases. Thought I saw a hand go up. I have a hand and a microphone. Uh, I have to test the spirit by the word of God. You have to test the spirit? By the word of God. By the word of God. That exactly right. Because there are spirits out there. We just talked about Lucifer there and the serpent in the tree. He will speak. And we see later when he's tempting Jesus, he'll quote scripture. He didn't quote it exactly word for word and change the meaning of it. And that's why we have to test the, the Spirit by the Word of God. You know, Jesus knew the Scripture. He knew what was written. When, when Satan quoted that Scripture, he knew that's not what it says. And, and therefore, he was not fooled by the devil. And, and that's just that goes back to spending that quality time, is being able to know when, when someone says something about the Bible, we recognize it. We know it. I, there was there somebody else? When... You talk while they're passing mic. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, I, I think we ought to apply what we're saying here to another aspect of, of this passage and a lot of passages. But this is one of those passages where there's so many cool things that you can pull from it. And I've heard multiple sermons, multiple, read multiple books on the idea of Jesus as our shepherd. There's just so, so much that can be pulled from it uh, as lessons for us. Um, and I think that we need to be careful that, oh, that sounds so beautiful. I love the way that pastor said that. Mm. And we need to be careful that what that pastor was saying came from Scripture, that, that the lesson being pulled mm -hmm. was one from Scripture. Yeah. And um, it's easy to say, oh, that's cool. I wonder if this means so-and-so. To spiritualize. But to spiritualize things away. And, and, and uh, that's what we need to watch out, that we're comparing Scripture with Scripture, that, that the conclusion we're coming to is a valid one based on this passage and other passages and, and good counsel, mm -hmm. like you were saying. Yeah, and I think that in terms of applying it to ourselves, the, the Old Testament passage in Ezekiel 34 in verse 4, he said, to the false prophets, the false shepherds. Mm -hmm. And so we can take a lesson, whatever he says they're doing, we need to do the opposite, right? Mm -hmm. And he said, you have not strengthened the weak. You have not healed the sick. You have not brought back the strays. And you have not searched for the lost. Mm -hmm. And so if we're not doing those things, then we're lining up with the false shepherds. Yeah, it's, uh, 
it's interesting to look at the analogy of the sheepfold, the sheep, the shepherd. But when we look at it in our hearts, what is Jesus saying to me through this? Am I a thief and a robber? Am I a doorkeeper? Am I, and we'll see, there's more comparisons we can give later. Am I a hireling? You know, am I a sheep? Am I hearing his voice? Am I listening to a stranger's voice? And I don't say all these things to bring up fears and make anybody afraid. All I'm saying, and I think that's what we're all saying, is if the sheep know his voice and we want to be sheep, then we need to know his voice. Because when the voice comes calling, we want to follow him and only him. And, you know, Revelation, book of Revelation says, you know, that group of people, that special group of people, they're the ones who hear his voice. They follow him. They follow the lamb wherever he goes because they know his voice. They, they cannot be led astray. And that is my prayer for all of us. That's my prayer for all of you who are watching online is that you hear his voice, you know it, and you follow him. It doesn't matter where he leads as long as you're with him. If you're following Jesus Christ, you can be assured that eventually, no matter where it leads here, eventually it's going to lead you into the kingdom of God in heaven for eternity. That's what we want, is eternity with Jesus Christ. Get to know his voice. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you that not only was Jesus here, not only did he live did he die for us? Did he, was he resurrected again for us? Not only does he minister in heaven currently for us, but he left his voice for us to hear. He left his voice for us to learn, to get to know, so that we will not be misled or misguided, but instead we will hear him loud and clear and we will know where he is leading us. And no matter what this life has to offer, no matter where we may be led here, that eventually there is a time coming, a beautiful day, when we will all sit around Jesus' feet. Amen. We will all spend eternity together. We will never more have to worry about thieves and robbers. We will never more have to worry about strange voices trying to mislead us. We will never more have to worry about being cast out of the flock. But instead, we will have the peace, the comfort, the joy of knowing that we are there with you for eternity. We so look forward to that day, Lord. We can't wait for it to come. But you know, Lord, we pray for those who have not yet accepted you, who have not heard your voice. And Father, that we are praying especially for them tonight too, that you give them one more call, that you keep calling their name until they do hear and until they do follow you because we want them to be with us in heaven too. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.